Well, their approach was that these very wealthy people were setting up this privately owned money monopoly to help everyone else. In other words, it was going to be compassion and caring all the way. And there would, it was presented to Congress as a bank reform bill. And uh, there were not going to be any more bank failures. There'd be no more monetary panics. There'd be no more financial depressions. And of course, uh, from 1914, when they started an operation, we went right to 1929, the biggest crash we ever had. Was the Federal Reserve System itself, was it also, do you think, partially responsible for World War I, Eustace Mullins? Not partially, totally. Uh, you see, they had wanted to have a major war since 1885. The problem was all the European countries were bankrupt because they had central banks. Whenever you install a central bank in a country, that is a sure road to, to ruin for everyone in that country. And we prospered throughout the 19th century because we did not have a central bank. Now, could you explain to me what a central bank is versus, shall we say, the national government bank? Because it's a little bit of verbicide here. We don't know. Federal Reserve, I mean, it seemed to me like the word federal itself, of course, we talked about, had to be a government institution. So if you could tell me the difference there. Well, that phrase was coined by Paul Warburg, one of the orig original conspirators at Jekyll Island in 1910, for that very reason. He was a very clever person. And um, a central bank uh, is different from an ordinary bank, is that uh, an ordinary bank or a government bank would be a bank of the people to provide the people with money. And uh, a central bank is a privately owned bank, which always takes the name of a country. You have the Bank of England, you have the Bank of Italy. These are privately owned banks which function as government banks, but, and, except that the private owners get all the profits. Mm -hmm. And the people of the countries which have a central bank, they progressively become poorer. Now, when the Federal Reserve Act was passed by Congress in 1913, we had no national debt. The, the dollar was 100 cents in purchasing power. Today, we have $4 trillion. We're did you and I get $4 trillion in debt? Did you go out and spend a lot of money that you shouldn't have, or did I? Absolutely Don't not. Don't ask me that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think you might spend $4 trillion, but it would take you a little while. But uh, no, all that money not only has been wasted, but it's been deliberately wasted to put us into permanent debt situation. Now, how is this money created? Because you're telling me that the government, our government ourselves, gave up the right to coin this money, and then all of a sudden the Federal Reserve System has the right to make dollar bills, Federal Reserve notes. Did, was there trickery involved there? But first of all, how did this happen? You talked about 1913, you talked about Jekyll Island. What were the mechanics that led to the change from the government owning the money and issuing the money to its people versus the Federal Reserve? Well, uh, I mentioned the conspiracy at Jekyll Island because it took a lot of plotting to get the people of the United States to accept a privately owned central bank. You see, we had one set up by Alexander Hamilton in 1787, the first bank of the United States. And Thomas Jefferson opposed it, and he got rid of it in uh, 1812. So that caused the War of 1812. The British attacked us again in 1812 because we had, Jefferson had put an end to their bank, and they retaliated with the War of 1812. In fact, you will find banking interests behind every major event of world history. They pull the strings. We're just puppets. The governments are puppets, and that's why the War of 1812 happened, the Civil War, World War I, World War II, you name it. They're bankers' wars. I've been told and I've heard that World War I, just take that for example, there's probably no reason at all to ever have World War I. Uh, there was an assassination and then there was a demand for an apology and the apology was given and pretty soon shortly after that Europe was entered into the war, the United States was entered into the war and could you explain to me what Belgian relief plan was as far as World War I? The Belgian relief plan was to relieve the Belgians who didn't need any relief. It was actually, you see, in 1916, Germany, through private sources, approached the Allied governments and said, I'm sorry, we can't go on with the game, you know, because to them, to the bankers, war is a game. They set up two opposing teams and have them play each other, 
and they're making money from both sides. So the game had gone on for two years, financed by the Federal Reserve System of the United States in 1914. As I said, they had no money for this war. But by passing the Federal Reserve Act, suddenly the money and credit of the American people was made available to the central banks of Europe to finance the First World War. That's the reason you had it. That's why you had all that bloodshed. That's why you had the suffering. That's why you had the collapse of monarchical governments in much of uh, Europe, all brought about as a banking conspiracy. So in 1916, the Kaiser said, look, uh, we're bankrupt. Uh, we're out of food. We have no fuel. So we're going to sue for peace. Well, this did not fit in with the program of the international bankers because they hadn't even gotten the United States into the war yet in 1916, and that was part of the plan, that we had to get into it. So um, they said, all right, we'll take care of you. We'll get you food, and we'll get you fuel, and we'll get you money. Well, the money was no problem, because these international bankers operate all over the world. They got him the money. Uh, but the food was a different situation. How was the United States to furnish food to Germany so they could continue to fight for another two years? And so. It had to be done through subterfuge, and so they called upon Herbert Hoover, an old Rothschild employee, whom they had hired, by the way, because he had been barred for life on the London Stock Exchange as a notorious swindler, and the Rothschilds said, get this guy, we need him. So uh, he went to work for them. And uh, sure enough, in World War I, they said, Herbert Hoover is the man to set up a Belgian relief commission to feed Germany so we can have another two years of World War. And that's exactly what happened. The great engineer, he was called. He was there, actually, the he great... He engineered a, a two years longer for that war, anyway. Well, he was the great swindler. He was the most notorious promoter of mining stocks uh, in the world. And, um, you know, uh, he particularly uh, promoted gold mining stocks. And, you know, a gold mine is a mine in which um, someone sells you the stock in a gold mine and they take, you, they take the gold and give you the shaft. <laughs> and so this, is, this was Herbert Hoover's background. He'd always given people the shaft. And so they said, now he's on the biggest swindle of all time. He's going to operate the Belgian Relief Commission. And um, he said, yes, I'll run the Belgian Relief Commission for you. We'll feed Germany with one proviso. I get all the money. And he did. Herbert Hoover came out of World War I, and the Belgian Relief Commission is one of the richest men in the world. No, it's my understanding that actually in World War I, 21,000 people in America also became millionaires amid the death and the destruction and the slaughter and the hardships of the soldiers. 21,000 people actually became millionaires. Does war itself, does it create different classes of individuals from a financial standpoint? Well, war is enormously profitable because it's so destructive. You see, uh, modern technology and modern industry produces so much that the competition drives the prices down, everybody goes bankrupt. So you have a war and it destroys so much that then everybody gets rich again, replacing all the stuff that was destroyed in the war. That's the story of modern uh, economy. When you set up a regime that you control, like in 1917 they set up the Bolshevik regime, and the American taxpayer has supported the Soviet uh, Empire uh, from 1917 right up till the time it collapsed. And the only reason it collapsed was that the United States was bankrupt and they couldn't send them any more money. So uh, we destroyed communism by going bankrupt ourselves, which I guess is one way of doing it. You said one time, Eustace, that uh, the Russians have been trying to make it through the winter every winter since its inception of the communism, and we've been helping them through <laughs> the winter. Well, the, the guy who helped them first was Herbert Hoover. Uh, after they sent him money, Wilson sent him money, and uh, then they said, we don't have any food. So Herbert Hoover, the great engineer, who was a Rothschild employee, after he had been banned for life from the London Stock Exchange as a thief and an embezzler, and the Rothschild said, boy, we want this guy on our side. Sure. So, so they hired him as a director of Rio Tinto Zinc, one of their family firms. And uh, so then uh, in 1916, the Germans said, look, we can't fight any longer, we don't have any more money, we don't have any more food, and we don't have any more coal. So the Rothschilds, the Rothschilds said, well, hang on and we'll see what we can do. So they got Herbert Hoover to inaugurate the German Relief Commission. But since we were at war with Germany, they couldn't well call it the German Relief Commission, so they called it the Belgian Relief Commission. And uh, the Belgians were suddenly uh, 
were astounded to find out that they were all starving when they had just had the best crop year they ever had. But anyway, the Belgian Relief Commission, which, by the way, was one of the greatest thieveries uh, in the world, Herbert Hoover and his pals who ran this uh, operation, uh, they all came out of it, multimillionaires. And uh, Herbert Hoover, several times, uh, remarked very sourly, some of these days, some prying SOB is going to want to look at our books. Well, no one ever did, and uh, they kept their money. But uh, after the Belgian Relief Commission, which kept the uh, Germany uh, in, in the wo World War I for two more years and brought a very satisfactory conclusion, then uh, they called on Herbert to help them out again. They said, look, the Bolsheviks are starving. Uh, they've shot all the peasants and the farmers, and uh, they have no food. So um, Herbert Hoover then organized Russian relief, and he went over and saved the Bolsheviks from total collapse. And somehow, after this, he became known as a great anti-communist, which just shows you what, when you control the media, you can uh, sell any story that you want. Absolutely. And one of the things that was so sad for me to read about, of course, was the uh, when the Bol Bolsheviks did go into the Ukraine and they did kill so many people, they starved between six and eight million Ukrainians out. And this is the end result of what the America has done because America itself, this government, not the country, I don't believe the country used to, I don't believe the patriotic people in the country, but this government was responsible for funding situations like this, weren't they? Oh, very much so. And in fact, uh, this great massacre uh, of the uh, Russian peasants in the early 1930s was deliberately suppressed by Walter Duranty, the chief correspondent in Russia of the New York Times, and uh, he dictated what would be allowed to be sent back to this country. They totally suppressed this so that Franklin Roosevelt as a principal plank of his uh, platform in 1933 that uh, was to give official diplomatic recognition to Soviet Russia so we could send them even more money of taxpayers' money than they'd been doing before. So, but they couldn't do this if uh, the press was going to print a story that uh, 10 to 12 million Russians had been murdered by Stalin. So the story was completely suppressed, and in fact, the American people today really don't uh, know whether to believe it or not. There have been several books out about it by Robert Conquest, which are very good, totally documented, but they don't get much play in the media. Now, we have, we have a number of people, different types of people, different nationalities in this world. We had World War I, we had World War II, we had South Korean War, and then we had Vietnam. Should we have fought any of those wars, Eustace Mullins? Was there a real reason? And what was the end of result of us being involved in, say, World War I and World War II? Uh, well, John, uh, you have to understand what wars are. Wars are carefully staged productions. Now, these are all carefully staged, and they did what they were supposed to do, and they had a good audience, and uh, so I think they were successful. But uh, to say that these wars were about anything, that they had some particular philosophy of government opposing another philosophy of government, uh, is, is total nonsense. These were world order productions, and uh, as I say, they were carefully staged. Both sides were set up to perform in a certain manner. And uh, the outcome was always predetermined. In other words, you were looking at a s staged production, uh, which you had already seen many times, a sort of a soap opera, and you knew how it was going to come out before it even started. Now, Eustace, you're a veteran, and I'm a veteran. And I know when I went in the service, I was just about as patriotic as anybody could possibly be. That's the way that I felt anyway. And, you know, I, well, I saw things in the service, Eustace Mullins, that would lead me to believe that I still love my country, don't get me wrong, but it's this government that I don't think that I'd ever fight for again because you just kill a lot of people, raise a lot of debt, raise a lot of taxes. I come back, the people are, are far worse off than they ever were before, and we seem to be enslaving ourselves. Is this true, or am I imagining things? Oh, you're not imagining anything, in fact. Um, I was in the Air Force during World War II, and uh, I can't say that we were very patriotic because uh, during our basic training down here at uh, Miami Beach, uh, we were marching along, drilling in the morning, and we were singing to Cadence, and we would sing, uh, I'll hate wall. Eleanor hates wall. My dog, Bala, hates wall. And all we did was make fun of these phonies in Washington, you see. So I, I can't say that we were that patriotic. 